Good evening, Starville Church. I hope you're doing well this Wednesday evening. We're so thankful we can gather together once again to be here, to have a time of praise, a time of prayer, a time of hearing His Word. We're, before we go to the Lord in prayer tonight, I'm just going to remind you next Wednesday night will be the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and it's our tradition to gather together and offer thanks to the Lord. We will be doing that in person in the sanctuary socially distance at the church at 7 p.m. next Wednesday night. So we'd just like to encourage you to be here, be on time, and come with something to share for the others that we can all join together during that time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, just asking that he'll speak to our hearts as we look to him. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight so thankful for your faithfulness. And Lord, we just ask that you would be in this place Lord, that our hearts would be focused on you. Lord, that we would enter in with praise and prayer, and Lord, receive a word from you. We thank and adore you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. If you would like to enter and join into worship, we're just going to begin tonight with Let There Be Glory on Honor and Praises. Let there be glory and honor and praises, glory and honor to Jesus, glory and honor, glory and honor to Him. Let there be glory and honor and praises, glory and honor. Glory and honor 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we worship you. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy toward us. Lord, we ask that you would be with those that are that are sick among us, Lord. We ask that you would be with our missionaries and with our unsaved loved ones. Heavenly Father, in this uh, in this uncertain time, would you be our peace, Lord? Would you call to remembrance all the times that you did not fail us? Uh, so that that would be the first thing we reach out to when we feel insecure. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with all of us today. Would you cause your words to go down deep? In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Tonight, we'll be looking at what the Bible says about towns. Tonight, I want to share a few interesting thoughts that I find kind of intriguing about towns, and that's the life of a town, and a few interesting thoughts about ghost towns and twin towns. Now, we've heard about cities and villages, but tonight we'll look at towns, and a town is neither here nor there. Uh, it is still a settlement with a defined border, smaller than a city, and yet bigger than a village. And if you've ever driven out or ventured off uh, the beaten path, you feel a sense of uh, isolation and desolation. And there's a real feeling of being far away from the things of man. In essence, you're on your own and you're in the wilderness out in the elements. And uh, we today have become so domesticated uh, that we are out of our element when we're out in the wilderness. And because of that, for us today, towns are a major hub of life. Uh, people from all over flock to towns to get the things they need to sustain their lives. Uh, towns offer goods and services. They are a source of provision for those who make it their home or for those just on the outskirts of its borders where people have to travel into to come into town. Throughout history, towns have been erected in places where people have considered the lay of the land and most cities are located where they are because they've been strategically placed. Now geographically, many towns are built in favorable locations that help facilitate the growth of the town and aid in providing goods for those who live there and those who come from afar. Uh, sometimes it's obvious um, why they are placed where they are and sometimes it's not. And throughout history, it's more often the case that most towns are built near water. Now water is life and that's what a town needs most. Flowing water is one of the most vital aspects of civilization. It's one of our most important basic needs. Uh, it's used for growing crops, uh, transportation and trade, and most importantly, for sustaining life. Being erected near water makes it clear that it is a town with many different routes for trade. And trade is of utmost importance to any particular place for the sake of having what we term a supply chain. Now obviously, scripture likens us people as unto a city. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. As God's people, we shine that light that others see so that they see God's works through us and glorify the Father, and they in turn come to the light. And that light gives people hope and shines as a beacon for others to find their way in the dark. We want to be that city that others can look to or go to. Just like cities have goods and services we need, there are certain people filled with those same qualities that have what we need. There are certain people in my mind right now that have exactly what I'm looking for at times. And in my mind, and for a lack of a better term, they got the goods. Those are the ones I go to when I need to. Now with the town, life pours in and life pours out. Towns are a center of life. In a way, we should function as a hub of life where the Lord pours into us and we pour out to those in our community. It's clear in scripture that the Holy Spirit is likened unto water that flows through each one of us to bring us life and to sustain us. With the town, life pours in and life pours out. Towns are a center of life. In a way, we should function as a hub of life where the Lord pours into us and we pour out to those in our community. We can be those that are a source of life to those who need it when they come to us. We can be those that offer life-sustaining substance to those in need when they come to us. And we can be that connection for others around us as a supply chain. Now this past summer, Hillary and I were on vacation on the west side of the state and we took a drive across uh, the state here and coming back home, we drove along the Grand River. And we stopped at a city called Muir, Muir, Michigan. Now this is a small town just east of Ionia. Muir was once a bustling town due largely in part to the logging industry. And the mill there utilized the flowing water of the river to run old steam saws. And the town thrived because the river provided what was needed for the industry and the town folk. And since then, the demand for the industry died out and life pretty much ceased. 
and what once was a bustling town had become a lifeless ghost town. Now sadly, it can at times be a pretty common thing for people to go through cycles of life where a once burning flame and a zeal towards God can become just a pile of smoking embers that haven't burned with heat or flame in quite a long time. And we don't want to be those that lose our fervor and zeal. And we must have a continuously burning flame through daily maintenance and a daily impartation from the Holy Spirit. We don't want to become like that ghost time where there was once a fresh move that over time died out and became lifeless. And the last thought I want to consider is the subject of a twin town or sister cities. For years, I worked out in Oakland County Airport out west of Pontiac, Michigan. And to get there, I would drive through the city of Pontiac. Coming home from work, I would obviously take the same way. But on my way home, I remember a sign on the side of the road, and it was the only place I remember seeing this sign, because I don't remember seeing one on the way to the airport going to work. But on a small road sign as you enter Pontiac from the west, it reads, Pontiac, sister city of Kusatsu, Japan, and Wallaceburg, Canada. Now, this sign was interesting to me because it was my first experience seeing such a sign or ever hearing about the thought of a sister city. And it also reminded me of my mom because my mom was born in the city of Wallaceburg in Canada. Now, this is actually a common thing where certain cities are paired with other similar cities around the world that share some sort of connection. For example, Indianapolis, Indiana is twinned with Monza, Italy because of their shared interest in auto racing. Now, I didn't really do a whole lot of research on sister cities until just this past week when I was considering this message. So what I really want to consider is that thought about having shared interests and shared ideals. Now, these so-called twin towns are partnered with one another because of these cultural or commercial ties. The purpose is to foster a friendship between cities to promote an understanding of culture or to promote trade and tourism as a shared interest. Now, considering what we had mentioned earlier about others having the goods we need and this thought of twin towns and a town being a source of life, the point I want to make is that thought of sharing ideals and values with those around us. The body of Christ is a hub that has what other members in the body need. We have what each other are looking for. And also, in a way, we have what those members who are not in the body need as well. We as the body of Christ have those goods that sustain life. And we should be that hub of life that others come to where we can share values and beliefs and most importantly, share the love of Christ. Hillary is going to come now and share her part on towns. Good evening. I'd like to continue with some further thoughts on towns. As Ken said, town is really just a human settlement. Towns are generally larger than villages and smaller than cities, and we tend to use those words pretty interchangeably where we come from. We often associate ourselves or others with where they're from. And in the census in Luke, we see that they did the same because all went to be registered each to his own town. They were accounted for in the original town where they were from. We have this sense of identity with our town, whether we like it or not. In Luke 23, 50, we see this example as well. There was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. So Joseph of Arimathea, it was kind of like a title, differentiated him and gave him some context. We also have the woman of Samaria, Ruth the Moabite, and Jesus of Nazareth. Now right away, this tells if we're local or from out of state, out of the country. And especially when I worked here at the church, I was Hillary of Starville Church. So where people are from is meaningful in scripture and in our lives. Now, because your town was tied to your title and your inheritance, we see that it was especially important when the tribes were receiving their inheritance. In Joshua 13, 28, it says, This is the inheritance of the people of Gad according to their clans with their cities and their villages. And in Psalm 47, 4, in the King James, it says, He, meaning God, chooses our inheritance for us. The ESV says he chose our heritage for us. Now the word inheritance implies an allotted portion, but heritage, we use that word a little differently. We usually tie that to culture, you know, our activities and meanings and behaviors. And in 2 Kings 17, we see the fall of Israel and their exile because of idolatry. And I'll just summarize this scriptures, but it's talking about how they walked in the customs of the nations that the Lord had driven out from before them and in the customs of the kings of Israel that they had practiced. They did things secretly against the Lord. They set up gods of other nations. They did wicked things, served idols, and they were warned again and again to turn away from this, but they wouldn't listen because they were stubborn. So they abandoned God's commandments and they followed the nations around them. They were worshiping Asherah and images of cows and serving Baal. And you read this and you think, wait, aren't these God's people? They were doing this? You know, God had an allotted portion for them, an inheritance chosen for the children of Israel. 
You could say he had a godly heritage set for them of godly culture and activities and behaviors that he had appointed. And they basically said, you know what? What the nations around us are doing looks a little better. We kind of want our portion with them instead. We'll just choose for ourselves. I always find it easy to read about Israel and think, how could they be so, well, dumb? I mean, who bows to a cow? Or who serves Baal when they know the living God? And yet, how many times does God have something for us and we say, nah, I kind of like these other options better. You know, who we choose to marry affects our inheritance. And I mean in every way, naturally and spiritually. Do you trust God to choose your inheritance for you when it comes to who you marry? There is a reason that God didn't want his sons marrying heathen women. He knew it would affect their inheritance. He wanted a godly seed without mixture. In other words, you could be a decent guy or a nice girl, but if they're not going to help you inherit the promises of God, you better reconsider. It's also true with raising children. And as simple as the things that we're allowing into our life, that mixture is going to affect our inheritance as individuals, families, and as a church. Now I want to be a daughter that God can entrust with an inheritance, proud to call his own and to give us the kingdom. I also want that godly heritage that comes from following him and not going after what the nations or the world has offered me. It's really a daily choice as an individual. But then God also puts us in a church, this little human settlement of a town that we could call Starville, because our spiritual inheritance is intertwined, like those tribes of Israel. Starville has an inheritance, promises from God that we're to obtain together. All the more reason that we want to encourage one another in the Lord and provoke one another to righteousness in our individual lives so that corporately we can inherit those promises. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. That's coming to church. As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now a town is just a community. A church is a community. And being in community speaks of being in fellowship as a result of shared goals. Now we have some shared goals here at Starville. We call it a vision and a mission to see the kingdom of God come to our hearts, our community, and our world, to pursue righteousness, peace, and joy by faith, hope, and love through worship, teaching, and good works. Now, part of sharing these goals and being in fellowship with each other in community is to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ from Galatians 6.2. And one way that we do that is walking with each other through life. That includes rejoicing together and grieving together. And in Luke 7.12, it says, we have an account of this, as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. So the town was grieving with her. You know, church creates an opportunity for a lot of funerals. I think my boss quit believing me after a while when I said I had another funeral to go to. But we had quite a few of them, especially back when Pastor Rob first came. And I still remember when my grandma passed and a whole church van of people showed up and others, they came over two hours just to attend that funeral. And it gave our family such a strength that we didn't even realize that we needed. Now this summer, Ken and I were on another trip and that trip got abruptly canceled. Nobody died, but we were so depressed when we came back. You could just feel the heaviness in our house. And I threw out one of those kind of SOS prayers to the Lord. You know what I mean? The kind of fleeting thought, it's kind of a prayer and kind of half-hearted. And I said, Lord, can somebody just stop by? And not long after that, a couple from the church drove by and they waved. And I thought, oh, I wish they would have stopped. And then they turned around and they came back and they pulled in the driveway and they said, oh, we just wanted to say hi. And we said, no, 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 stay. Come in and chat with us. It was just what we needed. And, you know, we marveled after they left because it was exactly who we needed when we needed them. It just lifted that heaviness that we were feeling. And it reminded me, we really need each other. We need one another in the body of Christ. You know, maybe we don't even know that we need each other, but we could be the answer to someone's prayer. Some of us are a little more needy than others. And you know, we tend to a child differently than we would tend to a teenager or an adult. But the way we tend to one another's needs is differently. It's probably unique to the way that God made us and what gifts and abilities he's given us. And some teams seem to just have that gift for noticing the needs of others and then running to meet it. But sometimes it's just being where God wants you to be. You know, that's exactly what others need to see just to be encouraged. We don't always have to be someone's answer or have the answer. Sometimes you just need to show up. Sometimes that simple wave from across the sanctuary might be all that someone needs to feel seen and encouraged. 
1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you're doing. We need community because there's always this danger of becoming an island or a sheep that gets separated off from the flock. You know, during this quarantine, COVID time, we've all been a little more separated. And they were saying how people in um, senior citizens' homes are dying from a lack of connection, not just from sickness. But the opposite can also be true. You know, we can get kind of sick people if we're together too often. And relationships are work. Relating to other people is work. The more of an introvert you are, the more you might need that alone time to recharge and get energy for the next extroverted event. But there's that danger of becoming isolated. You know, the enemy goes after the sheep that wanders off or kind of lags behind. And we become susceptible to the lies of the enemy or the lies that we tell ourselves when we're off by ourselves. We can get set in a way of thinking when there's no one to question or offer a different viewpoint. So God wants us to be in community, not an island or a kingdom of one. Psalm 68, 5 and 6 says, Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. He doesn't want us to be left alone. His heart is toward the widows and the orphans. And you'll remember, Pastor Rob gave a great message on this not too long ago about reaching out to widows and orphans. And that's not just people who live alone, right? So many people are working from home now. They're isolated, they're separated off from fellowship and community. But we have internet and we have phones and we're connected like never before, mostly for good, sometimes just a nuisance. But if we use it properly, it can be the tool in our hands to reach out and encourage one another to love and good works, to lift each other up, or maybe be that lifeline to someone who's kind of living on an island right now. You know, one of my best friends actually lives on an island, literally, her country is a small island. And it's halfway around the world, totally opposite time zone. You know, she's never felt further away than during this pandemic when even the idea of traveling seems impossible. And yet she always finds a way to stay connected and encourage me. She found out I was sick and the next day this Amazon package shows up on my front door with some tea and some snacks. And you know, suddenly it felt like she wasn't quite so far away. You know, we don't have to be all things to all people. We don't have to uh, have all the answers. Sometimes the most good we can do is just a smile and, hey, I see you here. We're in this together. That's community. You know, we've all used this example of Grandma Beulah, but it's such a good one because our whole congregation was blessed by her homemade cards and the scriptures that she would write and give to us just on little index cards. She didn't supply Hallmark um, with her overpriced greeting cards. But once in a while, I, I find those cards and it's just like a treasure. You know, oh, what did she say on this one? What did she say to me? And we also know that she prayed for Starville until her dying day. She used what she had and she blessed her community, which was Starville Church. And we can all pray and we need to do that more than ever. Uh, we rarely know the full story of what others are going through and we don't even need to know. But we can be sensitive to the Holy Spirit prompting us to pray for one another. And that's a way that the town provides for those in need. Now, the enemy wants you to believe that you don't have anything to offer, that you're better off just taking care of yourself or taking care of your own. But God calls us to be in community, to be in a body of believers for our own sake and for the sake of others. So if you don't think you have anything to give to this community, I challenge you to ask God this week, Lord, what do I have to offer? Because it's not just about this church. It's about what God has called you to do for his kingdom and how he wants to work in you through it. We all have something to give. So don't feel like, well, you know, someone else already does that. She plays the piano better than I ever will, or he's so good at speaking, they don't really need me. You know, the enemy wants us to compare our ourselves so that we'll neglect to pursue what God wants us to do. You know, each town has their butcher, baker, and candlestick maker, right? And the butcher doesn't go make candlesticks, and the baker can't bake forever. Eventually, he's going to want to retire, and someone needs to take over because the town will still need a baker, okay? So... If you aren't sure about your gifts or your place in the community, start asking the Lord, what can I do to give? Because we all need what you have. Now, Starville, it's actually a physical place. It's a village. It's not even a town. It's just a small rural community. We're still just a small country church. But as long as we feel God calling us to be here, then we don't want to neglect he is choosing our inheritance for us here. We want to be united in the vision and the mission that he's given. There's unity in community, literally, spell it out, U-N-I-T-Y, in community. And the church needs to be the example to the world of unity, especially in these days. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 7, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, 
endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in the hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, but unto every one of you is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. You know, there are families, towns, cities, and a nation that is crumbling around us. The church needs to arise in these days and show what a godly heritage looks like, how unity works under God, through his love, encouraging one another to press in and obtain those promises and the inheritance that he has for each one of us. The Lord bless you. Thank you, Ken and Hill, for that message on towns. And if we've grown up in this area, all of us have grown up in a town or close to one, and we have a pretty good idea of what they're like. But I'd like to just reiterate two of the points they made tonight. The first one was the importance of not becoming a ghost town that Ken mentioned. We need new life, new spiritual life flowing in from the Lord. And we've got to keep our daily maintenance up of reaching out to him, seeking him, praying, and being in his word. And the second concept, just kind of a summary of what Hill said, that one of community. We want to be a lifeline to someone who is alone. And I'd like you to consider, maybe even the rest of this week, who do you need to be in touch with that you can share part of life with because they need communication. And I'd like to encourage us all to do that, that we would reach out in community to those around us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Just ask that as we close this service tonight, he'll lead us in all of his ways. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful tonight for your word, for the message on towns. And Lord, we want to allow new spiritual vitality to be coming into our lives each and every day. Lord, we want to seek you. We want to be in your word so that new life will come forth. But Lord, also, we want to respond in community to those around us, to reach out to those in need. Lord, to see uh, communication happen with those who need it. Lord, would you work in us, speak to us, even as we reach out to others. We thank you and praise you for this message and ask that you would work in us and move in us the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen.